first in high definition from the station on your side. This is Wavy News 10. And we're starting tonight with what the weekend weather will bring. There'll be some rain, wind, and possibly that big word, yes, snow. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Don Slater, who is tracking the system. What's going on, Don? Well, with this whole system, it really hasn't even developed yet. We want to show you what's going on. We're watching out uh, for Sunday, and Sunday is going to be the big day with us. We're likely to see some rainfall into the region. Now, here's a, a view of what's going on right now. We've had a few stray clouds uh, during the afternoon hours, but nothing too terribly big. On the wider view of things, that's where we can start to see uh, way on down toward Texas. We're going to see some action develop. Uh, and here's our future track computer model on a very, very wide basis showing you what's going on. We're going to see that low pressure area move on northeastward and east northeastward. It'll move right about through here and then move offshore. Now that's where everything is, uh, and it'll continue moving east northeastward, by the way, uh, and move on out to sea and not really bother New England all that much. But you'll note that by Sunday evening at 7, there is some snow or a mix of rain, sleet, and snow even on down toward the Richmond and the Williamsburg area. So we're going to have to watch that very, very carefully. Right now, it looks like all rain during the day coming up uh, for Sunday, Sunday night after midnight. Again, that storm system is going to be developing. And with all that in mind, here's what we could see uh, with the snowfall for Sunday night. Now, note that I wrote in there, highly subject to change. Uh, it's a bit speculative at this point uh, to see how much we're going to get, but that's what the models are pumping out right now. Uh, we'll talk more about what we can expect. Uh, uh, for our weekend coming up, especially Sunday, in just a few minutes. All right, thanks, Don. You can count on 10 of your side's team of meteorologists for updates throughout the weekend. Now, a special victims unit arrest in Portsmouth. A former IC Norcom High School music teacher is in handcuffs. Clarence Sykes is accused of sex crimes against a child more than 30 years ago. Jason Marks is following developments in this case. What's going on? Yeah, Tom, 10 on your side has been working this story ever since that news broke of Clarence Sykes. We're told that these alleged abuse happened in the late 70s. At the time, uh, Sykes was working in, in Lynchburg, living there also, and we're told he would visit someone here in Portsmouth, and that's when that abuse happened. Now, Sykes has been charged with taking indecent liberties with a minor. We're told the boy was only 11 at the time. Sykes was in his mid-20s. He's now 57. He did make a court appearance this morning and was, and was released to house arrest. Ten on your side spoke with Earl Mobley, the Portsmouth Commonwealth's attorney, who said, quote, they have a very strong case against Sykes. We were told that he made statements to the police admitting that he abused that victim plus 11 others in Lynchburg. Mobley went on to say that the Portsmouth victim, who is now 46, is still in contact with Sykes and is not scared of him. The only reason why he went to police was he was concerned that Sykes might be abusing more children. Now, ten on your side, uh, did learn that Sykes taught in Portsmouth for a total of 10 years. He was first in the school system in 1997 to 2001, where he taught right here at Norcom. He then left and came back in 2005, where he spent time at Churchland Middle School as a music teacher before transferring back to Norcom this fall. Now, we're told that both times when he was hired and also when he came back to the school system, there were extensive background checks into his background, obviously, and nothing came up. No red flags because these were his first charges. What No red flags that would have not allowed him to come back and teach. We're told that he was arrested last night at his home. He did make his court appearance this morning. Uh, school officials actually found out about it this morning and found out that news. They did send him a letter telling him that he was suspended with Without pay. He has not been fired, just suspended without pay. So, meaning he was in the classroom yesterday. I did ask school officials whether parents were notified of this uh, of this teacher and they said they were not sure they did not believe that teacher that the parents got any sort of letter or were notified uh, that this arrest had happened of course we're going to continue to follow the details we'll have the latest for you coming up tonight on wavy news 10 at 6 but for now that's the latest here in portsmouth jason marks 10 on your side a story we will stay on top of and according to the school's personnel policy when a teacher is hired in portsmouth they can have misdemeanors, just not felonies, after they are hired. They are still allowed to be arrested. They just may be suspended or dismissed because of it. But nowhere is it mentioned that the teacher is required to tell the school about what happened. Now, this former Churchland High School teacher will not serve jail time for having an inappropriate relationship with a 16-year-old. Jurors convicted 37-year-old Cedric Cradle of two counts of indecent liberties with a minor. 
he could have received a five-year prison sentence, but instead got a $2,500 fine. An investigation revealed on Valentine's Day of last year, Cradle and the Churchland student left school property in his car. Police say they came back less than an hour later. Her parents filed charges three days afterwards. Cradle resigned from his teaching position. It's Black Friday in schools across Virginia. Teachers wore black in silent protest of education budget cuts. The effort started through social media over the weekend to mourn the perceived lack of commitment to public schools. We have team coverage of Black Friday in February, starting with 10 on your side's Ava Hurdle. Ava? Nicole, for many accounts, teachers joined by students and other staffers wore black to school to show a united front against cuts in school funding. We caught teachers arriving at Kempsville High School dressed in black. This in Virginia Beach, which is facing a projected $39 million school budget shortfall, mourned as part of a Black Friday protest. We had a lot of uh, teachers in black today, so it was nice. Leslie Shoemake is a biology teacher at First Colonial High School in its Legal Studies Academy and is concerned about proposed spending cuts. I'm afraid that if transportation is cut, we're not going to have enough kids to make the academies. Um, my, our particular academy has a lot of students with double working parents, single working parents that just won't be able to get the kids to school. That's just one concern, but there are others across state and local school districts. The people are wearing black. It's working. We're bringing attention to the problem, underfunding for public education, and people are mad and they're supporting us. And it appears elected officials are watching. Well, I'm extremely optimistic that the school board, the city council, and the state legislators will work together and certainly not let the greatest school system in the Commonwealth go backwards. We should know in the next few weeks just how the funding for schools takes shape. Meantime, the Virginia Education Association is encouraging people to email, write, or call legislators and ask them to restore money to education. I'm Ava Hurdle, 10 on your side. Well, some state lawmakers also dressed in black to show support for teachers. Senators Yvonne Miller, Louise Lucas, and Manny Locke posed for pictures this morning in Richmond. I called the Democrats to ask if their actions will speak louder than their wardrobe choice. Senators Lucas and Locke contend they've always fought for teachers and students. This is what happens when people don't pay attention to elections and they get people into office who want to destroy public education as we know it. Those people, Lucas refers to, are her Republican counterparts. And she knows it's going to take more than a fashion statement to change their minds on teacher contract limits and other cuts to education. The thing that can make a difference right now is for everybody to start jamming phone lines to the governor's office because now it's in his hands. Overwhelming numbers of letters, overwhelming numbers of phone calls and emails and faxes or any other means of communication, actual presence there at the Capitol, uh, that makes a difference. Or maybe not. The governor's office sent 10 on your side an email response. It says the governor's proposed K-12 Opportunity to Learn Education program includes nearly $500 million in new additional funding, not cuts, and will recognize Virginia's teachers for their success and, most importantly, yield better results for our students. So that doesn't sound like he's going to make any changes in the budget before it's presented to lawmakers on Sunday. So while Democrats hope for a compromise, they are more likely in for a fight. By the way, I was unable to reach Senator Miller for comment. The Virginia Education Association has a form letter on its website for anyone who wants to contact legislators. We posted a link on wavy.com. Well, the water's back on in Sandbridge, but it might not be safe for drinking or cooking just yet. The boil advisory could be in effect for another day there, all because of a water main break overnight in a swampy wooded area near Hells Point Creek. Well, now that it's fixed, officials want to test the water to make sure it's safe. Now, in addition to boiling your water, it's also a good idea to empty the ice in your freezer and turn off the ice maker until the boil water notice is lifted. Hundreds of customers are missing their tax refund money from Mo Money Taxes. New tonight at 5.30, 10 on your side, find out where it is. And 10 on your side's working the case of a Chesapeake police officer killed in the diving accident. We have answers about the equipment used by Officer Timothy Schock. Plus, bed bugs in a local elementary school. Find out what officials are doing to stop their bite. You're watching Wavy News 10 at 5 with Tom Shad. Nicole Libus and Super Doppler 10 Chief Meteorologist Don Slater.
A Hampton Elementary School found two bed bugs in classrooms. Tucker Capps Elementary sent a letter to parents after the first bed bug was discovered Wednesday. A pest control specialist inspected and treated the classroom. Then another bed bug was discovered in the classroom next door on Thursday. That classroom was inspected and treated that night. A school spokesperson says the entire school will be treated on Saturday. The face, neck, hands, and arms are common sites for bed bug bites. Small, flat, or raised bumps on the skin are the most common sign. There were lots of hugs and kisses today as more than 100 local sailors returned home after six months at sea. The USS Montpelier returned to Naval Station Norfolk this afternoon. The fast attack sub logged 36,000 miles while working in Norway, Scotland, and Spain. Congress passed a deal to extend the payroll tax cut through the year and continue unemployment benefits. That deal extends a 2% cut in payroll taxes. That'll keep the rate at 4.2%. But this deal would add $100 billion to the national deficit. Now, the tax cut extension heads of the White House, where President Obama will sign it. That tax cut extension also means a cut in how long one can get unemployment benefits. Come September, people without a job can collect benefits for up to 73 weeks in states with the highest number of jobless. Right now, the maximum is 99. The benefits will be cut off after 63 weeks in most states. When you brush your teeth, you don't usually consider that a hazardous activity, but one popular toothbrush is causing injuries. We're on your side with a warning from the FDA. Ted on your side has unanswered questions on the death of a Chesapeake police officer, so we wanted answers, and today we got them. Wait till you hear what the manufacturer of the diving equipment says about the results of this investigation. Saturday is looking fine. We're going to see some clouds move in. Uh, Saturday night after midnight, some rain, and then we're really watching Sunday. We'll tell you more about what we can expect with our forecast. Impossible. That's what a dive equipment manufacturer says about the Chesapeake Police Chief's claim. Chief Calvin Wright says their equipment failed, causing an officer's death. Officer Timothy Shock died in December during dive training. This week, Chief Wright said Officer Shock's power inflator and ripcord release failed. And after his death, during testing, 12 other divers' ripcord releases failed. Ten of your sides, Melody Woodrow has been digging for answers and has an exclusive interview with the manufacturer's president and engineer. Melanie, what does he say? Nicole, Zegel Dive Systems president and engineer both say the Chesapeake Police Department has not contacted them. They haven't seen the equipment officer Shock was diving with when he died, and neither have we. These pictures that you see behind me, the Chesapeake Police Chief provided to the media are examples of similar dive equipment. The manufacturer's engineer tells me they're not even broken. Zegel Dive Systems president and engineer say they learned there was an alleged problem with their equipment when Hampton Roads Dive Stores started calling them about 10 on your side's report. In it, Chesapeake Police Chief Wright said 12 divers' weight release systems failed during testing after Officer Timothy Shock's death. What? You know, 12 would fail? And what was the test? Who tested Chesapeake Police have not said. The chief has said the department made mistakes. Certain parts should be sent out to a factory representative, which we did not do. Why not? I don't know the answer to that. According to Zegel President Dennis Bulin, the significance of sending this equipment to a certified technician is stated right on the equipment itself. Your BCD, including the inflator, should be inspected and maintained by an authorized Zegel dealer at least once a year and more often if you dive frequently. Zegel engineer Jim Fox says Officer Shock should have aborted the dive the moment he realized his power inflator was broken. That was one of about five or six things uh, that, that started this whole snowball. Once Officer Shock could not get to the surface, Zegel's president says he should have dropped his weights. Police say Officer Shock could not. Sometimes people modify the ripcord system too. That's why the the fact that 12 of them failed is very, very, very curious and bizarre because that just doesn't happen. Siegel's president doesn't know if they were modified because he hasn't seen them. They have a real diving expert look at the equipment, all the equipment that was actually used, and, and investigate the training procedures and everything that was done. Uh, I think you're on the right track. You're going to find out what the real problem really was here. 
And we're staying on this track, asking Chesapeake police questions about the dive team's training and equipment. We'll have some of those answers in our next half hour. We'll also let you know what the other city's dive teams around Hampton Roads had to say today about their equipment. Melanie Woodrow, 10 on your side. And coming up at 6, Melanie will tell you what type of dive suit Officer Shock had on and why that detail is important to the investigation into his death. Now, in high definition, your Super Doppler 10 forecast with Chief Meteorologist Don Slater. And a look at what we've got going on with uh, this storm. It hasn't even developed whatsoever yet. Uh, so again, we're uh, going to have to watch it carefully coming up over the weekend. So some of this stuff is going to be a little bit speculative in terms of, <coughs> pardon me, estimating the snowfall amounts. We're over 48 hours away from this uh, if it does indeed happen. I think we'll get some snow out of it. They'll get a lot of snow on off to the northwest. I don't think we'll get much. Once you hit Williamsburg, though, that's where we could start to see a little bit more significant accumulations, Middle Peninsula, Northern Neck. And we want to show you where the storm is coming from. Here's where we are at midnight tonight. We're going to see clouds start to sneak in tonight. Uh, but mainly during the day, four to mile. There's the storm developing and mainly moving east northeastward and emerging off Cape Hatteras and strengthening. Now, uh, I've heard I've heard some talk about oh, this is going to be a nor'easter out of this. Well, not really. Not a traditional nor'easter. Traditional nor'easter kind of develops slowly into here and then it just explodes off Cape Hatteras right about into here and then moves uh, right on up the coastline and heads toward New England. This is following more of a track where it goes right about through there and then uh, on offshore. So we'll see one high tide that could be problematic uh, with some minor or very minor tidal flooding and that'll be on Sunday evening uh, but otherwise I don't think we'll see a problem with uh, uh, tidal flooding that much. It'll be rainy on Sunday. Sunday night after midnight we can see some of this snow sneak a little bit farther southward. Now we'll, we'll take a closer view show you what's going on with this. We're watching Sunday. We had a few clouds during the afternoon today. It'll be quiet overnight. Very, very light winds becoming more wet Westerly. Here's where we are tomorrow morning. Quiet during the day for tomorrow. South southwest wind at about 10 miles an hour. End of the day, 10 mile an hour winds. Little slug of colder air moves in. Kind of a wind shift line drops in tomorrow night. There's where things are at midnight. But then by four or five, six o'clock in the morning, we're starting to see some rain. And certainly by seven o'clock in the morning, 15, 20 mile an hour winds at seven o'clock. Warm front down into here, and that'll kind of be the track where this storm uh, moves along. Uh, and you'll know. With the mixture of rain, sleet, and snow to the north of Lynchburg, solid snow once you get real, real close uh, to the Charlottesville area. And that's where they're going to see the big snow off to the mountains, uh, off into the mountains during the day on Sunday. For us, we are going to see rain and we're going to see some wind, east northeasterly winds, 20 to 30 miles an hour for much of the afternoon. Now, by 7 o'clock in the evening, the storm itself has emerged and it's not likely to go northeastward uh, and really give us some problems in terms of tidal flow. Flooding. Uh, it'll give us some minor tidal flooding Sunday evening, uh, but it'll continue east northeastward out to sea and it'll drag some of that colder air and possibly some snow back on down into the region. Now, through Sunday evening at 7, Zippo as far as snow, but they can see six and a half inches of snow off toward the mountains. And remember, some of this snow is going to drop a little bit closer, but after midnight Sunday night. Now, it's still, again, 48, 60 hours away. So this whole situation, it in terms of the snowfall amounts, highly, highly subject to change. But again, uh, it's speculative now, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Wind and rain coming up on Sunday, and then Sunday night after midnight, some snow, cool Sunday night, a little cool on Monday, then warming up the rest of next week. Pain reliever problems, why Johnson & Johnson is pulling an infant medication off store shelves. Plans to give the Virginia Beach Oceanfront a makeover, now on hold. Why the city is delaying the sand replenishment project tonight at 5.30. We're on your side with a warning about a popular toothbrush. The alert from the Food and Drug Administration concerns the battery-powered Arm & Hammer Spin Brush. The FDA says the brush heads can pop off and break off in your mouth or near your face. Several people receive cuts to their mouth and gums, chipped or broken teeth, and injuries to the face and eyes. Others swallowed or choked on the broken pieces. The risk is higher for unattended children or adults who need assistance brushing their teeth. To prevent an injury, the FDA says you should inspect the spin brush for damage or loose bristles every time before you use it. 
Johnson & Johnson is pulling all infant Tylenol off the U.S. market. Parents are having problems with redesigned bottles, apparently. They say the protective cover on the top doesn't work correctly. The new bottles are intended to make measuring doses easier by limiting how much the liquid can be drawn into a plastic syringe. Instead, parents are complaining that they are pushing the protective cover into the bottle. The company says that you can continue using the Tylenol if the bottle remains intact. If not, contact the company for a refund. We have more information about this on wavy.com. A woman dragged as two men on a motorcycle tried to drive off with their purse. Wait till you see what happened when a witness got involved. And Norfolk Mayor Paul Frame has big plans for the future of the Mermaid City. Hear what he wants to do with Waterside. That's next at 530. Four, five. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Check, check, check. Yeah, they wouldn't take any suits. Check. One, two, three, four, five, six. They're calling a man in eastern China a hero after he stopped two men on a motorcycle from robbing a woman. The video explains it all. You can see the suspect trying to snatch the victim's purse. She fell to the ground and was dragged. Ow, oh, that's painful. A bystander says he had something to do, so he rushed in to help and cut off the motorcycle with his car. That Good Samaritan also fought with the suspects. They got away. The victim called police during the fight, and officers later got those suspects. Wow. Stay with us. Wavy News 10 at 530 starts right now.